Good evening. I'm David Traum. I'm the co-founder of Save Our Sites. Uh, tonight we have as our guest Dr. Randy Mason, Pro Professor of Historic Preservation, City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the director of the Center for Preservation of Civil Rights Sites, uh, sponsored by the Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Uh, Randy Mason is now going to, to give an illustrated lecture discussing his work at the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites, which conducts research, teaching, and field work related to Black heritage places marking civil rights histories. The center advances the understanding and sustainable conservation of these heritage places. Now I want to turn the lecture over to uh, our staff member, David Safa, who's going to tell us about how the Q&A uh, session will be handled. David? Uh, Thank you very much, David, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I just want to ask that if you do have questions, that you please put them in the chat and then I'll read them at the conclusion of the presentation, allow us to answer everything. So with that, I'll turn it over to Randy. Great, um, David uh, okay. David, and David, thank you both very much. Um, hope all you all can, can hear me perfectly well. Um, uh, thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, it's, uh, it's a delight to, uh, to join uh, Save Our Sites for their annual talk. And I'm uh, honored to be able to tell you about the work that, uh, that I and um, my colleagues are doing at the Weizmann School of Design um, with a lot of partners in, um, in far-flung and nearby places uh, to, uh, to advance, um, as David Traub said, the, um, the preservation of civil rights sites uh, in, uh, in all the things that, uh, all the places that that invokes and all the things that that means. It's, uh, we regard this um, as uh, a really important uh, kind of work that the preservation field has been woefully behind in addressing uh, over over a long time, uh, and we are uh, uh, at, the, at the initial stages of the of the center's development. We've existed for about a year and a half, so we continue to build our team and to uh, uh, and to talk to to uh, new partners and and uh, launch new projects. And so I really appreciate your listening tonight and we'll be really grateful to have your your comments and questions and suggestions um, as we go on this, this evening. I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, in among our group tonight um, two colleagues from here in Philadelphia who are doing the very important work of, uh, of preserving and advocating for the preservation of civil rights sites and right here in Philadelphia, Ms. Gary and Ms. Robinson. Um, thank you. Thank you particularly for joining us. Um, and uh, let me just uh, share my slides, if, if you will, allow me to click here and there. And can everybody see uh, the first photograph with the title? Great, thank you. Um, so um, I will try to, uh, to um, tell the story of, of where the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites has come from and what we're aiming to do uh, in about 40 minutes or so uh, to leave ample time for, for your questions and comments. Before I launch into um, the center and its work, I wanted to help set the stage for it by talking about a different project that a colleague and I have recently published and, and completed. It's, it's a, a report on a survey that we did um, about a year ago of uh, people who work in the historic preservation field about their attitudes toward change. And the, um, I'll, I'll appreciate if you want to dive into the details of it by downloading it from the Penn Praxis website. Um, but I wanted to, to foreground some of the, the, the results of that, um, of that survey because they, they make clearer why uh, organizations like the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites and other, uh, other efforts to reform the historic preservation field by connecting better uh, to partners who are outside of universities and outside of design fields and outside historic preservation for the most part, to really uh, make those connections more profound and more honestly and more openly, uh, and to, uh, to you know, essentially make ourselves more relevant and useful to the issues of the day and the, and the important histories that have been uh, undervalued and, and made invisible, and in some cases erased over the years. Civil rights histories are certainly uh, important among those. 
the overall headline, uh, if, if there's just one headline uh, about this survey, it, it demonstrated to us that people within the preservation field uh, see very clearly a need for really profound and fundamental change because the field lacks diversity, because the traditional ways of doing preservation, while important, are not sufficient to meet the challenges of, of the 21st century. Uh, and there were lots of different attitudes toward change, but there was consensus, um, and the, I won't try to interpret this whole uh, series of, of graphs, but this is what's in the, in the heart of the report. There's a kind of an overwhelming majority of the folks that we talked to, over 2,000 respondents from the preservation field, um, that uh, significant change is needed. And so against that context of um, uh, a changing in society and a historic preservation field that has been, uh, in my mind, too resistant to change, um, we, we aim to, uh, to fulfill our mission that David Traub has already um, uh, kind of spoken about. Um, we, we think about our mission in terms of the straightforward um, uh, declaration that we have on the screen now uh, that we work to, uh, to sustain heritage places commemorating these important African-American histories about civil rights uh, and to support and build capacity among the folks who are already doing this work. We also mean to achieve a kind of a, a shadow mission, if you will, of reforming and changing the historic preservation field, again, to make it more responsive, more creative, uh, and um, more honest when it comes to the histories that are not well represented in our built environment today, the histories that are not well represented in architectural uh, significance or architectural legacies. So the preservation field in our minds really needs to embrace these, these larger, deeper future challenges. Before I go in further into the formalities of my uh, presentation, I uh, always like to pause at the beginning of a talk and to ask all of you sitting at your homes or in your desks um, to answer a question, um, to, to, to tell all of us um, a little bit about what you envision when you think about a civil rights site or a site of civil rights heritage. Uh, what do you picture? Um, and it, what is it about that image that you find compelling uh, and uh, a, as a call to purpose for, for preservation? And what I'd like to do is just ask you to type that into the chat and we can come back to it uh, in the Q&A period uh, and, uh, and to kind of uh, reflect on what we as a group, how we are envisioning civil rights sites because it's, it's uh, long story short, it's not as straightforward as we think it is. There are many, many uh, uh, issues related to civil rights histories and many kinds of site that we need to address. So um, in the balance of, of the talk, I will uh, organize it around these three topics. First, I'll talk a little bit more about the current moment that uh, American society is in and, uh, and, and trying to reckon with uh, the difficult histories and the fraught politics of telling and recognizing those histories in public space. Secondly, I'll talk about creating this, the center. And lastly, I'll go into a little bit more detail about exactly what the center is doing um, with our partners and with our students here at Penn. So the context um, uh, goes um, very deeply and very broadly into everything that is on the headlines of our newspapers, literally and figuratively these days. The New York Times, uh, fantastic and, and serious project to retell the, the origin story of the US through the 1619 project has of course been very controversial uh, within and within the professions and, and of course in, in larger society and in the culture war politics of our moment. Uh, I think that no matter your attitude toward the, the story that, uh, that uh, the 1619 Project is telling, uh, it is a recognition that issues of memory and commemoration uh, and the legacy of our country in every aspect, whether it's the built environment, our educational system, uh, our, our politics, our economy, um, are, uh, are a very important public and political issue. Uh, this is a call to purpose in my mind for preservation professionals as for historians and, and community advocates to engage with these issues about how our stories are told. 
that, of course, is uh, it's not the only, only expression of this important um, moment of cultural conflict, if you will. Um, if one looks near and far, whether in Montgomery, Alabama, where we've been working with partners, uh, thinking about traditional preservation of um, old ship AME Zion Church, as well as in the foreground of that picture, the, uh, the quite amazing uh, National Memorial to uh, Peace and Justice, um, AKA the lynching memorial that the Equal Justice Initiative has created. Whether we think of buildings being destroyed uh, here in Philadelphia, uh, Doctors Row as an example, um, erasing, further erasing uh, histories of African-Americans uh, in, in, in here in Philadelphia, and an un continue to unfold um, uh, issue uh, such as the Tanner House in Strawberry Mansion, uh, which of course is the subject of, a, of an advocacy movement that I hope you all know about and are contributing to um, uh, uh, here uh, at the moment. The, uh, the, the scope of, uh, of uh, civil rights heritage uh, is, uh, goes beyond individual buildings and individual stories and really is the story of our whole society, particularly in the mid 20th century, but I think stretching back to the 19th and 18th centuries as well. Um, this pair of pictures I think encapsulates a, a really important moment in our national history that's being more prominently talked about these days how highways and infrastructure construction uh, in general was used not just to uh, improve mobility or for economic development reasons, but also to destroy uh, neighborhoods of uh, black homeowners, for instance, in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, there are, of course, instances in just about every American city where the, the route of the highways um, was not incidental. It was, neighborhoods were targeted. And you can see here um, the, the west side of, of Montgomery on the, on the left um, was um, you know, largely destroyed by, not largely destroyed because parts of it are still quite, quite alive, um, but uh, severely damaged by the imposition of I-65 and I-85. This, uh, this call to purpose with um, uh, civil rights heritage has already created some really interesting um, uh, responses among preservation and museum and histor historian professionals. Um, one of the ones that I've found most uh, kind of illuminating and provocative is the discussions around how Rosa Parks should be remembered. Uh, she is, of course, is in every person's mind as a civil rights icon, but her story was far more complex than just the, the, uh, the, the notion of her uh, protesting um, uh, by, by keeping her seat on the bus and the bus boycott that followed. Her house in Detroit that you see uh, the space of on the lower left, um, where she moved after leaving Montgomery, um, was later demolished. And um, strangely, a long story short, um, and we can go into it in the Q&A, the house was dismantled by an artist, uh, taken to Germany, re-erected, re brought back to the US, re-erected, taken apart and taken back to, to Italy recently and put on display in, uh, in, uh, in Napoli. Uh, and now it's in shipping containers. Uh, so this important piece of heritage has literally been in motion. It is almost literally um, in the sense of uh, kind of a fugitive expression of built heritage. So it's neither a house nor quite an art project. It's something in between, but I think it captures some of the difficulties and the, and the challenges for traditional preservation, not really being able, uh, able to, to handle all of the challenges that, uh, that, that civil rights heritage and, and black, the black experience of civil rights heritage present us with. Uh, this call for change in the preservation field is not confined to academics or to, to, to me and my team at Penn, um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and its National Impact Agenda published last year. Um, also um, called very clearly for change in who are preservationists, what preservationists do, and even how preservationists see their brief and, and, and see their relevance in, in modern society. And just to put a finer point on it, this is a, a quote from our, uh, from our report. And uh, just to highlight that 37% um, uh, of our respondents called for really profound change of, of how preservation works, uh, even dismantling uh, some of the current um, policies, laws, um, 
methods like uh, national register listing and, and a landmark listing in general. And an additional 50% nearly of the respondents um, called for various levels of, of, uh, of change and updating of preservation. So there's a real, I think, restiveness among preservationists for how to change. And now the, the, the issue now is like, not whether we change, but, but how exactly. Civil rights sites, I think, present us with some really interesting challenges uh, in terms of his issues, histories that were that have been uh, erased or ignored or underinvested in for a very long time. So just to, to kind of uh, um, uh, summarize uh, that there are a lot of, uh, of drivers for change, both in the larger society and in the historic preservation field. Uh, that uh, created um, uh, a, an opportunity for, for Penn's Historic Preservation Program and Penn's School of Design um, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to act uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, recognized these challenges, uh, devoted resources to these challenges, and also uh, expect these challenges to, to feedback and, and change the way that we teach preservation and practice preservation ourselves. So the, the center, um, to get to my second topic, the center was created uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, it was created on the basis by the Historic Preservation Program um, uh, here at Penn. Um, I was the, I'm the founding faculty director, but as you'll see in a moment, there's a, a, a large and diverse team um, that I work with uh, um, to, uh, to, to guide the center to, uh, to do its projects its, and, and more. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that this work is built on um, my own career of 25 plus years uh, working uh, in uh, urban neighborhoods and on uh, histories that are variously described as traumatic or uh, difficult um, or dissonant uh, histories, uh, in, as they, one says in the academy. Um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, the, the work I've done here in Philadelphia and Detroit and other Washington, D.C., with lots of different kinds of uh, government clients and, and nonprofit clients uh, really uh, kind of prepared me for um, the, the, the particular challenges of trying to, to start this center. I also think that uh, I did a project for about five years uh, in Rwanda, uh, in East Africa, about uh, that had to do with uh, conservation of memorials to the 1994 genocide uh, in that country which one might think is unrelated to uh, American history, but I think there's, as, as the years pass, I understand more deeply the, the profound connections between um, these, uh, these um, institutionalized um, episodes of violence that happen in, sadly, in most countries, uh, in different ways, of course, but in most countries, and create a, um, a, a category, if you will, of traumatic heritage that is uh, difficult to deal with, difficult to know how to deal with it exactly. The center was uh, the real. The spark for the center was a partnership uh, that happened beginning in 2019 with Tuskegee University and their architecture department, which of course has an amazing legacy of teaching architecture, doing preservation, uh, and they had made a, a, a deliberate decision to teach more preservation within their architecture program. Uh, we were uh, connected with them by a, a funder uh, based in New York. Um, to essentially for a teaching partnership that uh, we would uh, contribute to Tuskegee's curriculum. Uh, yeah. We would do projects together. Our students would connect on different kinds of projects. And here you see in the lower left, my colleague, Professor Kwesi Daniels, the department chair of architecture uh, at Tuskegee, who's been our, my principal partner in developing the center and especially in doing our work in Alabama, who's uh, just a, a, a a leader in every sense uh, in his own community, in uh, the architectural community, and in the preservation community. Here, giving a tour of some of the Tuskegee buildings where the students in the late 19th century mined the clay, made the bricks, constructed the buildings, uh, and then learned in the buildings. Just an incredible story of, uh, of, uh, of, of achievement um, uh, in uh, this uh, small town in Alabama, of course, led by Booker T. Washington. Tuskegee and, uh, and our center uh, together last summer wrote a, a grant application to a new program of the Andrew Mellon Foundation uh, called the Humanities in Place Program. 
uh, and we were um, very pleased to, to be substantially supported to continue and deepen our work together. Um, uh, a shared uh, project that over three years will invest a million and a half dollars in our students and our projects and in uh, elevating and advancing the teaching, research, and practice around civil rights sites. Uh, who's doing the work? Uh, this is uh, a current snapshot of, uh, of both faculty and staff, students, um, supporters, uh, leaders of, of, our, of the Weizmann School of Design, um, who together in various combinations um, helped conceive of the center and helped keep it moving. The one person I will, two people I'll call out, um, you'll see um, Professor uh, Daniels there on the upper right, uh, and uh, in the top line, third from the right, um, a gentleman named Brent Legs, who many of you probably know. He's the director of the National Trust African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, an extraordinarily successful and um, leading preservation effort to foreground the, the preservation nationally of African American heritage. Uh, Brent is also an adjunct professor in our school and uh, the senior advisor to the center and just an, an essential part of uh, the conception and leadership of, of all of our work. So if that's the, the kind of creation story, uh, what are we actually doing? Uh, well, just to remind you, this is our, our, our mission, to, repeating an earlier slide, um, where we foreground the notion of sustainable conservation of heritage places commemorating African American histories and the American uh, and other stories of the American Civil Rights Movement, and I'll go more deeply into exactly how we define those various terms. But I do want to emphasize that we uh, we focus our work on sites of different kinds, and try it in its simplest form to guarantee that they are sustained through time, so that future generations will have the benefit of contemplating these places, learning their stories, um, reckoning with uh, the difficulties of our histories and the celebrations and, and victories of, of African-American civil rights histories by actually experiencing some of these same places, whether it's a building or a landscape or a collection uh, or, or a journey. In, in every uh, aspect of, of our work, um, whether it's the work we do collectively with Tuskegee or the work that we do here in Philadelphia um, on campus or with off-campus partners, we are always um, emphasizing that our activities have to contribute to training and teaching, to research. We are a research university and that is the, the coin of the realm within universities. So always have to publish our research. Uh, and we are uh, always engaging in field projects and actual practice um, to, to drive research and training. Um, we do this, my colleagues at, at Penn and, and elsewhere um, do this as a natural course of our work um, in teaching preservation. We always all have active practices uh, in addition to our classroom work and our, our academic research. So this is nothing new, but just a kind of a reaffirmation um, that this work uh, on civil rights sites um, has to include all aspects of these, uh, of all, all three kinds of activities. And, we, and we, we take on these activities toward three overarching goals. One is to build partnerships um, with organizations already active and working uh, in the space of, of preserving civil rights sites and African-American heritage, supporting them and not trying to do our own projects or, or, or make our own way. Secondly, uh, as I said, sustaining heritage sites and organizations. Uh, we think very carefully about um, management and resources, um, legalities and, and other aspects of sustaining places that go beyond the physical challenges of preservation. Uh, and uh, as, a, as an aside to that, our initial work, our, the initial th three or four years of our work is focused on Alabama and on Philadelphia because of our responsibilities uh, and connections here in Philadelphia, and because of our uh, fantastic partnerships um, with Tuskegee and other groups in Alabama that we were uh, introduced to from the start. Um, there are plenty of other places where these issues are very important, um, but we saw the need to really focus our efforts geographically at the outset, uh, and of course to publish our work so that hopefully it will benefit other places as well. 
The, the third point, um, again, this reiterates something I said at the very outset, is that we, we intend this work um, as we search for uh, new method, methods and means and ways of organizing preservation to, to diversify and decolonize our own field, uh, to, to understand and, uh, and ameliorate the, the politics of preservation that have been barriers to having it be more relevant to more aspects of, of, uh, of civil society. Uh, we have been greatly elevated and, and sustained ourselves by great partners and, uh, and funders and also um, client groups that we uh, have, have done work for. Um, they, of course, start with Tuskegee and the Alabama Consortium of Civil Rights Sites. Uh, they include public agencies, um, individual sites, again, in Alabama as well as Philadelphia. Yeah. National Park Service, um, uh, I, I uh, direct a, another research group here at Penn that does a great deal of cultural landscape documentation and cultural landscape plans for the Park Service. Many of those sites that we work on are sites related to civil rights and African American histories as well. Uh, and then you can see also some of our funders uh, that have uh, uh, you know, provided the, the, the funds to, uh, to create the center and to engage in these partnerships. So um, let me speak for a moment about some of the, these kind of key terms, uh, and unpack um, some of what we mean by them, uh, the, the, the terms in our title. Um, civil rights, um, I feel like in, in every conversation about the center, um, it, we, we need to and, and always do, almost always do have a conversation about what we mean by civil rights. A lot of ink has been spilled to very good effect over the years by historians and and, uh, and legal scholars and civil rights advocates themselves uh, defining civil rights. I think of it uh, simply as the, the rules that govern how we relate to one another as citizens. Uh, rules that of course are fundamental to our, uh, our kind of um, self-claimed ways of, of governing the country, um, but came into a particular focus in the mid 20th century as the capital C, capital R civil rights movement because of, the, of the, the continued denial of civil rights, especially to, to, to black citizens. Um, so while one, the public may often think of, and, and, and we as, as professionals of various kinds often think of civil rights as relating to uh, iconic moments and iconic people and iconic conflicts uh, in the 1950s and 60s in big cities, um, in the South and also in, in the North. Um, and that might be a starting point, but it's by no means the whole story. And so we are we're very keen to uh, uh, to to uh, to project the uh, the important um, understanding that civil rights uh, uh, issues and civil rights victories um, began long before uh, the civil rights uh, capital C capital R battles of the 50s and 60s of the 20th century. Uh, and they continue in many ways long after um, the, the 1960s. Not much was resolved in 1968. I think everyone will agree. Uh, so we, uh, that translates in terms of, of historic preservation that we don't just look at iconic sites and we don't just look at iconic figures and narratives. We have to look at the, the kind of everyday, ordinary, um, uh, ubiquitous stories about civil rights struggles, civil rights victories, and ways that civil rights are embedded and inscribed in the built environments that we have responsibility for. By preservation, we mean, um, of course, traditional preservation, fixing buildings, restoring them, rehabilitating them. Uh, we also have to think more broadly about, again, how to um, tell stories, recover memories uh, in terms that might not be very well supported by, uh, by existing built environments. Uh, buildings that were destroyed, sites that were changed uh, might, uh, might only be preserved, uh, so to speak, by creating, uh, for instance, a digital humanities project that brings uh, a story and a site to life uh, in, in digital form. Uh, so that one can appreciate the the erasure and the and the, the full story, um, so it's we have to go beyond um, the our, our traditional tools of of architectural work of public policy, uh, and uh, business practices uh, to think even more broadly about what are the means at at, at our disposal. And by sites, we actually um, 
mean to, to raise a question as opposed to resolve an issue. We raise the question that um, sites like Rosa Parks House, for instance, um, sites like um, the, the uh, quite amazing Harriet Tubman Trail on the Eastern shore of Virginia, which is uh, an extensive journey. Uh, it's not an individual site in, in, this, in, term, in the ways that we typically think about it in preservation. Um, uh, the Underground Railroad, of course, which has been a, a, a subject of, of such amazing work historically and also in preservation terms over the last generation. Um, there, there are other conceptions of site that we need to appeal to, again, in order to tell the full story uh, of, uh, of uh, civil rights memory and civil rights heritage. Uh, so uh, in the course of, uh, of, of trying to um, create projects and, and pursue this work, again, uh, as, uh, um, as research and as teaching and as professional practice, we are engaged in both conventional kinds of preservation, traditional preservation, and also unconventional and, and, uh, uh, and uh, more creative uh, forms of preservation. They include typical nominations, cultural landscape projects, also ethnographic studies that we do um, often with our, our National Park Service uh, cultural landscape projects, innovating with historic preservation curricula, um, which, which relates to here at Penn, as well as, um, uh, as our, our colleagues at Tuskegee uh, increase their curriculum, thinking about organizational and business models as, uh, as a way to, uh, to, to an, an important ingredient, key ingredient to sustaining sites. And as I'd mentioned, uh, digital humanities, um, uh, tools and platforms and techniques that can uh, bring stories to life in ways that uh, the traditional preservation can't. Uh, so to give a, a quick glimpse uh, in the next few minutes of some of the, the, the places that we're working with in a more conventional and traditional sense, um, what, this is a, a, a glimpse back into the Tuskegee Pen Partnership and some of the things we've been doing together. There's a group of Tuskegee students that you see on the, on the lower left that I recently did a workshop with down in Tuskegee. Um, on the upper left is a, a group of Penn students. Um, we were doing a studio in Montgomery last fall, and we uh, took a, a, a trip to spend a, a day with uh, Professor Daniels um, touring Tuskegee campus and some other sites. And then this project that you see on, uh, on the right of the last slide and uh, uh, here uh, in, uh, in this slide is uh, a wonderful project that Professor Daniels started a few years ago, and we've joined him in working on. It's called the Armstrong School. Uh, it's in rural Alabama in Macon County uh, near Tuskegee. And it is, um, some of you may uh, know of the story of the Rosenwald schools. Uh, 5,000 or so um, segregated schools built in the American South in the early 20th century um, with, with some of the funds donated by Julius Rosenwald, the uh, financier and, and philanthropist. This school um, from Armstrong School from 1906 was a precursor or a, essentially a model for the Rosenwald schools designed by Tuskegee architects, uh, paid for by the, the uh, very poor agricultural black community in which it's situated um, as its own school. And of course, after 1954 and Brown v. Board of Education, uh, these schools often lost their purpose and some of them fell into disrepair. Um, Armstrong School, as you can tell, needs some, some physical assistance and some physical fixing and preservation work. Um, this is the, uh, the school you see right here at the center with the, uh, the metal roof. Um, it exists on a two acre plot of land um, that was bought by St. Paul's Baptist Church, which you see here and with the red roof. The church fathers bought the ground uh, in 1900, uh, two acres, and created this, uh, this community space of their own, a, a, a cultural landscape of their own that includes the church, the school, the ground around it, a baptismal font, and a graveyard that you can see at the bottom. Graveyard, which not incidentally uh, contains the graves of individuals who were involved in the Tuskegee syphilis study notoriously, uh, which was happened nearby. Uh, so as we um, continue to work with Tuskegee students and faculty and the folks who uh, own and, and steward the school and the church, um, we are inching toward uh, a, a sustainable future for this building where it can be physically stabilized, interpreted, uh, an organization um, uh, uh, supported, 
uh, and, and finance so that it can you know, continue to, to care for its own heritage. This is a place that I think everyone in the, in the country can go and learn a great deal from. It's in a very remote place. Not very many people will go to it. Uh, and it won't ever be and shouldn't ever be a, a kind of a, a popular public museum, I don't think. Um, but it has important stories to tell as a kind of an archive for the future. So we're very, very um, committed to, uh, to this project um, as a project in and of itself, but also a, um, uh, I think a model for how we collaborate across uh, racial and the university and, and social and geographic lines um, to, to do a better job collectively of, of, of preserving um, civil rights landscapes and buildings like the, the Armstrong School. So I hope uh, to show you in a future, um, future talk, um, the, the, not the finished work, but the, the repaired building and, uh, and the, the next version of the Armstrong School. Uh, in our studios here in Penn, we also um, include a lot of um, uh, sites and, uh, and, and organizations that are devoted to civil rights preservation. In the last few years, we've worked with Marian Anderson, Historic Society Museum and Grad Hospital, with the Paul Robeson House and West Philadelphia Cultural Alliance here uh, in West Philadelphia, and as you see um, with uh, St. Paul's Baptist and Armstrong School. Um, sorry, we're a little technical difficulty. Okay, I think you can see the Montgomery slide now. We did a studio last year on this area of the west side of, of Montgomery that I showed you earlier, where the, um, the highway um, demolished a good part of a neighborhood called Peacock Tract. Uh, we did a studio there last fall with Penn Preservation students, uh, where we did adaptive reuse studies for two remaining buildings in the neighborhood the Loveless School, uh, an elementary school from 1923, and a remnant uh, gas station and commercial building, both of which were on the route of the 1965 Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March. The Voting Rights March literally went right past the Loveless School, and you hear the students in the, up, in the upper window watching the march, which is, of course, a National Historic Trail and a, a place of unquestionable significance. But by paying attention to the ordinary buildings that surround this, this site of an extraordinary event, we thought that was a really important way that we could reinforce the idea that civil rights heritage is everywhere, not just in a few buildings. Uh, and this summer, we are starting a project again with Tuskegee and uh, the Alabama Consortium of Civil Rights Sites um, to, uh, to pilot a, a, a method of doing very quick uh, sustainability site assessments so we can help uh, sites that have very little or, or in some cases no management um, capacity uh, to understand the, the, the physical preservation challenges, uh, interpretive tools available and uh, management and financial resources and access to those um, to advance the sustainability of the existing organizations. We're going to be working with a not yet determined uh, pair of sites in Montgomery this summer uh, with the hope of, uh, of uh, eventually um, uh, doing a study of all 20 sites in the Alabama Consortium uh, and helping them as a group and individually um, advance their preservation goals. We also um, uh, commission summer internships, um, uh, Tuskegee students as well as Penn students to write national register nominations for civil rights sites again, in both states, and with the, the express goal of um, making them eligible for the very substantial civil rights grants that the National Park Service has been uh, making available over the past several years. Half a million dollars, uh, for instance, to, to do an HSR or to do capital repairs. Uh, and as, as every organization um, uh, has to do, we have, have tried to create um, good and clear and robust communications tools to get the word out about our work, to connect people who are interested and, uh, and uh, want to be informed about our work uh, or the work of our partners. So our website that you see the address of here has um, uh, information about our work, but also uh, resources available, uh, four to 500 um, curated resources that have to do with the history, preservation, um, issues of memorialization and commemoration, scholarship, professional reports that have to do with the, our, our main topics. 
there's just a little glimpse of the keyword search that you can do on the uh, on the website. Um, so we hope you visit that and, and find some some new things to study and discover for yourselves. We also stay active on social media, as everyone needs to do these days. We've got a great Instagram account that my colleagues Sarah Lerner and Steph Garcia um, uh, uh, always have uh, uh, new information up. So every every day or two, there's another civil rights site that you can learn about just by following us on Instagram. Here's a, a sampling of them around the country uh, with little stories and glimpses. Again, just to kind of keep this in everyone's eye and mind. We host events. Um, hopefully some of you have seen or, or heard about uh, some of the dialogues events that we do with uh, professionals and scholars who are uh, active in the space of civil rights heritage and preservation. Uh, they include our own Philadelphia, Philadelphia's um, treasurer, Louis Messiah, um, as well as a number of other um, architects, historians. Nikita Reed is a, uh, an arch preservation architect who's a graduate of our school for instance, uh, and uh, you can see the rest of the videos of those uh, of these events um, on our website. So um, I'm uh, at, at a conclusion, but I um, always um, like to end with a, a note of uh, both inspiration and challenge and James Baldwin's writings, I think, present us all whenever we pick up any of his work at any point in our lives with, uh, with challenges and, um, and inspiration. Uh, and this is one that I recently shared uh, on the syllabus for one of my classes, so I thought it bore repeating, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's certainly um, shines light on some of the central issues and, and motivations behind the center's work, but I think it's going to be meaningful to us all in our own situations about how we need to learn to use history and to use it for good. Uh, and to use it for, uh, to, to, to reckon with uh, the, the difficult moments of our histories and even our own lives. So with that, I will um, end with uh, an invitation to send me an email, um, uh, uh, look at our Instagram feed. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, stay and in, get involved or stay involved if, if you like with, uh, with our, our work. And, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll appreciate again um, the invitation from David Traub. Uh, and uh, whatever questions you all have. So I'll stop sharing now. Oh, uh, Randy, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we, I can. We, we want to thank you immensely for this incredible presentation. Now we understand what you're doing out there uh, at the University of Pennsylvania with the, the Civil Rights Sites um, Organization. Uh, your, your lecture was a good follow-up to our, uh, our program in, in the autumn, our, our autumn lecture, which uh, uh, concerned the Docks Thrash House. Uh, as you said, it's not a civil rights site per se, but it certainly re relates to that, to that issue, the, the home of uh, the, the incredible African-American artist Docks Thrash in Philadelphia and the group of young preservationists all from Ben who restored it. Now we'll uh, add that uh, just tooting our horn that Save Our Sites about five years ago, uh, gave a tour of the Marion Ander Anderson House in South Philadelphia five years ago, before there was much interest in the house or the, or the current civil rights um, uh, consciousness evolved. So that's, that's something we're very proud of. And that, uh, I noticed that Judith uh, Robinson chimed in regarding the Tanner House, which she's involved in. Maybe she'll ask a question later. But Judith Robinson is, is one of our members and she's very much behind the restoration of the Tanner House. Uh, another um, uh, Philadelphia African-American artist. Uh, and we hope maybe next year to present a program about what's happening there. So uh, now I'll turn the uh, program over to David uh, Safa who will uh, conduct the Q&A uh, session. Great. Thank, you. thank you, David, and thank you again, Randy, for that uh, illuminating and very generous talk. So I'm just looking through the chat here. Why don't we start with your original prompt about what you think of when you think of a civil rights site? So I will read, we have Girard College. I would include houses owned by African-Americans shortly after the Revolutionary War made a little book about such property at a 623 Lombard. And corners where great gatherings happened and venues where performances or speeches or speeches or gatherings 
of moment occurred. Yeah. Can, can I just uh, pop in, David? Um, yeah, please. So David's uh, plural. Uh, to, um, I wanted to to go back to something that David Traub mentioned a moment ago, the Doc's Thrash House um, and the uh, Doc's Thrash House and the Tanner House. Um, I think it's an interesting question about whether we regard those as civil rights sites. I would say absolutely, um, because the people connected to those places who, who made their lives there um, also um, struggled against and uh, and overcame in, in, in substantial ways and represent um, uh, our our you know uh, fraught history of um, of the, the uh, unequal access to opportunity and resources that that continue to to mark our history. So I think Doc Thrash's story about creating this creative center. Um, and, and his own work um, uh, as, a, as an artist and, and Philadelphian. Um, all of the amazing uh, connections to, to so many aspects of Philadelphia that passed through the Tanner House, not just Henry Asawa Turner and uh, Tanner and his, his artistic work, but all his, you know, the family members connected to him. It's uh, as, as someone, uh, Ms. McDonald just, just uh, noted, it's a national historic landmark um, and uh, it, and for for even for reasons that go beyond why it's listed, uh, so I think that those even those may not be capital C, capital R civil rights sites. I think they're absolutely uh, related to civil rights heritage. I'm I'm glad to you know have alternative views about that, but um, um, Mr. Rogers, I think you probably agree with that. Oh, I, I mean, I just heard Gerard College, and I just always remember to separate that you know Cecil B. Moore. And the freedom fighters that are North Philly, that you know, came to Gerard College and created this sort of like breakthrough moment of how to integrate Gerard College, uh, which is the continuation of work that Raymond Pace Alexander, Sadie Tanner Alexander did a generation before. But I always try to position that when we talk about the history of Gerard College, it's it's really a history of North Black North Philadelphians and their struggle against Gerard College, and trying to you know. I think they, the historians at Gerard College do a good job of teasing out that point too. I was just playing around in the chat, but always good to be here. Uh, Chris Rogers, Paul Robeson House, also part of the Friends of the Tanner House Project. Excited to hang out. Sorry to call on you, but you're right next to me in the Zoom in, in the Zoom grid, so I'm looking right at you. Wonderful, thank you. There are a bunch of other um, you know places that I that I you know would um, that would come to mind. Um, um, to my mind, um, you know, quickly, uh, places like uh, Mother Bethel, um, Gerard College, of course, uh, and then some others that I uh, that I that I'm not as aware of their their story. Uh, the um, I guess the Rosenwald home in Abington is that the Julius Rosenwald family. Uh, the Lucretia Mott marker. Um, I think it, you, uh, someone has said it's in Elkins Park. I. I somehow recall that there's uh, Lucretia Mott's gravestone is in Fairhill Cemetery. Ah. Yes, I'm Marion Rosenbaum, and um, I, I uh, live in Jenkintown. And the the sites that are close to me that I uh, are this Lucretia Mott home was right on Old York Road in Elkins Park, and the the house was torn down. Uh, uh, it's called Latham Park now. It's actually a, a fenced-in area of homes right next to where Camp William Penn was, mm -hmm. in right on the edge of uh, Cheltenham Avenue. But I've always uh, wished that we could uh, uh, know more about Lucretia Mott. Uh, Absolutely, so and I would I I I, um, I feel always a responsibility to uh, repeat something that I think uh, Dr. Quasi Daniels first told me. Um, but but uh, an historian uh, who, who knows a lot more about the Rosenwald schools um, in that the Rosenwald fund paid for, I think it was one sixth of the cost of the schools. Mm. The, the other money came from the communities. Mm. So, you know, the, the, it's named after Julius Rosenwald and he was very generous. But I think we also have to understand it as a story of um, communities building their own institutions uh, and celebrating that, uh, and not just lamenting the, their, uh, not just lamenting um, their, you know, what happened to them, but uh, celebrating 
their creation and their their service to their own communities for such a long time. The other untold story in Philadelphia is the Underground Railroad, and there's no way to document because it was uh, done in such secrecy. But we pretty much know that the Underground Railroad went from Quaker meeting to Quaker meeting. But I don't know how we we pull that more of that story out. So well, I would I thought, thank you for bringing that up. I would say, um, without trying to be too academic, I would respectfully say that. Um, to say that we can't document that is uh, we is kind of um, just reinforcing the the traditional um, kind of rules of evidence and rules of documentation that um, that apply very well to uh, the histories of the wealthy, powerful, and white, um, but don't apply very well to others' histories. Um, and so that you know, I think the the way that we document the past um, has also has to be re-examined. Uh, and I won't, wouldn't say just kind of like made a kind of a wide open festival of whatever story you want to tell, but um, looking at things like oral histories, um, documented traditions, and the scholarship of anthropologists, there are many other ways to to bring stories to uh, to to bear. Um, outside the, um, the, 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 the strict traditional rules of historical documentation. So it's not an either or, but I just think we need to broaden our, our, our perspectives and methods. Now, I understand what you're saying, Randy, but I was with the Germantown Historical Society for 15 years, I was in the library and uh, there's just simply, uh, there are no, there, we, we could not find oral histories um, and uh, we have evidence of a few basements and caves and tunnels, but it's very difficult to get the stories. Um, and so I, I, I've, I've tried, you know, I've tried. I'll say that there, you know, it depends. It depends on what we mean by evidence. So we we can. You're, uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, that that'll be next week's talk, right? Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, to, if you don't mind, um, uh, if I. Could just call out one of the questions that I thought raised a really um, important issue that uh, that that we're we're beginning to work on, but but uh, um, I think is is really important. Um, the question about uh, land ownership. This is uh, Susan Frank's question, marked eight thirty seven. Um, we all know from the stories of well, many stories in Philadelphia, the Coltrane House maybe first among them, Tanner House as well. Um, that the uh, issues of divided ownership uh, have been a particularly um, difficult issue in, in Black communities uh, since, since Reconstruction, since the possibility of Black land ownership was widespread. Uh, that is uh, an, a civil rights issue uh, that has to do with, with uh, legalities and with uh, predatory uh, lenders and um, other authorities that there's some really incredible work going on, um, especially by um, a scholar at Texas A&M, whose name now escapes me, Thomas Mitchell, I think his name might be, who won a MacArthur um, about his research to, to correct these, uh, you know, the, the uh, heirs' rights issues. Now that is a, a civil rights issue that has materially affected the way that uh, many communities have developed physically. So I think it's very much a preservation issue. Uh, as it also is an economic and a social issue. Um, and of course, it has important legal dimensions as well. Um, we are, um, one of the projects we're doing this summer is with a group in Alabama called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, uh, which has existed for a couple of generations doing work with black farmers, including on heirs rights issues, but they also like teach kids how to manage cows and, you know, you know do forestry and, and very practical stuff like that. So we're helping document their uh, one of their training centers, which also incidentally was a place where SNCC did their training uh, in the 60s. Let's see. If I could, I have a question. Uh, my name is Stephen Peitzman and I'm with Nancy Pontone. I'm a retired, mostly retired physician and medical historian, but in recent years, I've become a very active preservationist writing nominations to get 
buildings on the Philadelphia Register in a very traditional way. And I'm also a jazz enthusiast. And so I'm thinking about the Coltrane House and others like it. In, and also by extension, the, the homes of the, the prominent black artists that have been mentioned. And I'm totally in favor of saving and, and restoring the Coltrane House and putting it to some kind of use. But I was discussing this with some other preservation friends. And when we think about it, maybe less important than the house in which John Coltrane cured himself and, and worked on his new and more advanced way of, of composing and playing jazz is the fact that we have a tremendous record, literally, of, of his music, just as not necessarily all in Philadelphia, we have the works of Tanner and so forth. So in the, the theme of tonight, in terms of thinking about preservation more broadly, what might one do to uh, encourage more individuals to listen to the music of John Coltrane and others, some of which is quite difficult actually in, in his later work. In other words, where does that fit into a sense of cultural preservation for particularly for African-American creators? I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Rogers. Um, I, I, I think it's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, but I, and I think there are many, many directions. So um, Chris, I would invite you to, to make a comment. Thank you. Well, I got the perfect answer for you. And that is the John Coltrane Symposium, which was started by Anya Buile Love, uh, who wrote his dissertation on Coltrane's music and now hosts a yearly um, festival that is a couple days. It was headquartered out of Church of the Advocate where he is highlighting the importance and the legacy of Coltrane's music. Um, I can, if you give me a second, I'll pop the link into the chat of the website so you can get in contact with them. But he also, you know, runs a, a, a bookstore, a pop-up bookstore called Bailey Street Books, which is over there on um, Bailey Street next to Brewery Town Beats, which is also an amazing place to recover a lot of Philly uh, music history. Um, so that's, that's a, a lot of that work is happening there. And also just want to give a shout out to Faye Anderson. If folks are you know, uh, familiar, I'll just put her site into the work as well. Uh, but she's currently working on a historical marker for Lee Morgan, which I think is currently in progress. Uh, so, you know, a lot on that front. Um, and I see somebody else has their hand raised, so I'll get to putting those links in the chat. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's all great. I think the preservation community, a broader preservation community can participate in making those kinds of activities better known perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see that Eleanor uh, has her hand up. So Eleanor, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I just want to remind everybody that right across the Delaware River, of course, is New Jersey with many, many, I'm sure, civil rights uh, sites that need to be preserved. I <clears throat> recently learned about Timbuktu, which is in Burlington County. It has uh, physical uh, footprints, physical ruins of, uh, I think, a free Black community, but one that experienced hardships and a and, uh, good bit of history. So I just want to remind everybody that um, we are surrounded by sites and history uh, that we should become more aware of. Well said, thank you. I see two hands. Um, Susanna Bruco, it's great to see you. Hi, Randy, and, how are you? And your hand. Uh, and I see um, uh, Deborah Gary's hand as well. So maybe Susanna first. Just a really quick question. I, I don't remember, was it the Armstrong uh, property? Um, school, yeah. Yeah, the school. So so what will what will happen with that once it's hopefully stabilized and preserved. Is, is there a plan for it? You mentioned that it was hard to get to. I yeah. feel like some of these sites, they're at a disadvantage because of their location, you know, and I think that's a challenge. I mean, one that should be, you know, should be dealt with, but I, I was curious about that one in particular as you're working on it. Yeah, so- a Great um, talk, by the way, thank you so much. Thanks, Suzanne, nice to see you. Um, so the, the stabilization is already underway. Uh, first stabilization, and and then we are 
um, working on a, you know, a, a kind of a, a slow, gentle path with the owners and Tuskegee and a couple of other Alabama partners on a preservation plan. Um, the one that is, you know, is uh, realistic and sustainable and recognizes both, I would say, the advantages and disadvantages of being remote. Uh, one of the advantages is that you won't get, you know, it's not easy to, to get a ton of school buses there because it's right next to the highway. And that is, you know, a, another mode of preservation, if you will. And Ms. Gary, thank you for raising your hand. It's good to see you again. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, really, I was just going to introduce myself. I was just here listening, uh, just, you know, um, to hear really what everyone else's thoughts were. Um, so for those that don't know me, cause I'm new to this area um, of this topic of, we are, um, I am co-founder of the Society to Preserve Philadelphia African-American Assets. So everything that you're talking about this evening are things that we would, you know, be interested in being aware of who's doing what. So the society would not be say the organization doing everything, it would be partnering with organizations like we did talk earlier with Professor Mason um, of who's doing what, because for example, the question about, you know, how do people become aware of John Coltrane's actual music, you know, and then Chris had an answer to that. But, you know, just the fact that, you know, no one knows everything that's going on and so we hope to help educate more um, of the people here in the city of what's going on. You know, so we, we would have to find about it ourselves and then also be a resource for people to be aware so that we could one, be aware of it, you know, pre help preserve it, you know, help point resources to it. Um, you know, or, or again, help support it in some way, help encourage um, activities if necessary, you know, like if there wasn't anybody doing, um, you know, promoting Coltrane's music, for example, then it would be maybe encouraging somebody to do it. But in this case, Chris had the answer, you know, um, it's either that project or it's uh, Faye Anderson and all that jazz, you know, so Again, that's something that we will be doing. We're a fairly new organization still in our establishment mode um, because there, uh, in my mind, we perceive there wasn't any organization here in Philadelphia focusing on it from a broader perspective of preserving our history here in the city, um, which could be broader, which well would be broader than civil rights sites, depending on what definition you, you use. Um, so again, just introducing myself um, and, you know, it was good listening in to everybody and I was following also on the comments in the chat, um, you know, just uh, like I said, to keep us aware of what the things are that we should be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And I just put the, your website, I believe, in the chat and along with the Facebook group. And I just want to make a plug for everyone that there's a lot of amazing links people are putting in the chats. And what you can do is click the ellipsis and save the chat. If you, you know, haven't clicked every single link, if you save that chat, you'll be able to look at this stuff later. To, to build on Deborah Gary's um, uh, uh, appeals, uh, to, you know, take a friend who doesn't think of themselves as a preservationist, take them to the uh, Paul Robeson house, take them to Mary Anderson house, you know, take them to Johnson house, you know, take them to uh, a site uh, and show them um, the power that these places have to, you know, to understand the, the, uh, you know, the lives of others that we, you know, we need to honor. There's no, no substitute for actually going to the places. So um, spread the word and, uh, and take a friend. Okay. Well, in that regard, uh... Uh, I'm sure you all saw the flyer that we sent out or else more than likely you wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, but, but, but the flyer shows the, the civil rights site uh, at the corner of 40th and Lancaster Avenue here in Philadelphia where Dr. Martin Luther King in 1965 gave the important Freedom Now speech. 
to 10,000 people who gathered there at that intersection. Now, in 2011, Save Our Sites uh, uh, identified the, the, the bank building, the West Philadelphia Tile, Title and Trust Company as an endangered site which it was then and still is. I was just out there a few weekends. It's a, it's a magnificent building right behind where uh, Martin Luther King spoke. Uh, and it's still in bad condition. And, and uh, hopefully as, as a honor to uh, Dr. King and somebody will be restored. But I urge you all to go out to that intersection, 40th and Lancaster to, 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 see, to see it. It's an important, site architecturally and urbanistically. There's another another bank building in, uh, in a, a classical style there. Uh, there's a little park and then there's the uh, a bust of, of Dr. King and a, and a marker and, and then a, a mural by Cliff Eubank. So that's an important site that we all can see that's nearby, very close to the University of Pennsylvania campus, by the way. Thank you. I had one question, okay. For uh, Randy, uh, you use the term decolonization, okay, in, in your literature there. What what can you speak to that? I'm curious about that. <laughs> so, but, well, it's um, it's I would say it's um, it's a a concept that um, has lots of different uh, meanings and potential applications, but I think fundamentally it um, it shines a light on um, the patterns of power uh, that have, uh, have guided the way that land has been developed, cities have been developed, um, countries have been developed uh, in, uh, at the behest and in the control of one small group. Um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, typically in our experience in, in North America, um, powerful white Christian groups uh, and um, have uh, not only well have created legacies. Um, they are they are they are historical moments in themselves, but they've created legacies that we are still trying to address and unwind and understand and reveal today. Um, so you could think, for instance, of the the lending practices for home ownership in American cities in the 1920s and 30s and onward. Uh, as a kind of colonial practice in the sense that it was um, uh, guaranteeing that the powerful and the wealthy remained powerful and wealthy. And in so doing prevented um, the colonized, um, you know, poor, uh, not, I wouldn't say poor, but working class and, and even middle-class black folks in cities denied them access to capital that, that whites had. So, if there's an inequitability in access to opportunity or capital or education, that's a civil rights um, issue. Uh, so I think it, it's a, a way of calling attention to um, historical and firmly formalized uh, disparities of power. Um, and uh, there, there are more, um, more strenuous and extreme uh, uh, interpretations of it as well. But I think at a, at a most general level, that's, that's what I would offer. It's very interesting. And I think that uh, your answer is very revealing, something we should all think about. I, I, me, sorry, if you allow me just one, one more word, I think one of the ways it's interpreted in historic preservation is that uh, you know, uh, institutions of great privilege like Penn are educating future preservationists uh, and that that tends to reproduce um, the you know the, the kind of colonial politics, if you will, of uh, the way that preservation has historically benefited the the white wealthy and powerful. Um, that of course has been changing for a long time, but I think in many minds not fast enough or profoundly enough. Uh, and we're in a moment now where the change is speeding up. It's more profound, uh, and it's. I think that the depth of uh, the, the kind of colonial arrangements behind many institutions um, are being uh, are are being recognized more and more widely, and therefore I think are more likely to be changed. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions or anything we should talk about? Yes, there is. There. Uh, I think we should close the.
uh, the program. I want to thank um, David Soff again, and of, of course, our lecturer, Randy Mason. I do have a few announcements regarding um, Save Our Science and our programs forthcoming. Uh, early in, in, in July, we're going to have our, uh, our summer tour that we always conduct. Um, and this year, it will be a celebration of the architect, John Haviland who is the architect for the Atwater Kent Museum building. It's been in the news. Uh, well, it's been in the news and, and yes and no, but the collection has been in the news, but, but everyone has kind of forgotten about the building itself that has been left behind. So we're gonna uh, uh, go to that building, take a look at it, and then we're gonna uh, look at four, four other buildings in the vicinity that uh, the John Haviland designed. Uh, in, including the uh, the cathedral, the uh, Greek Orthodox cathedral, and we're going to go inside and see the sanctuary. So you'll hear more about that program early in June. Uh, and early in July, we're going to tour the St. James the Less Church uh, uh, complex. There are about four or five buildings uh, in the RH neighborhood. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure most of you know about it but it's a marvelous architectural ensemble and we're uh, gonna be uh, giving a tour of it. I might add that, that the, uh, there is also a school that's a part of the complex that serves the, the largely African-American community. It's, it's, it's a private school uh, that, that serves uh, the children in that, that, that immediate vicinity. And we'll have a chance to kind of look at that and, and the administration will, uh, administrators will speak about that. So that's coming up and you'll all hear about it in our emails. So uh, let me thank everyone again, uh, uh, David Safa and Randy Mason, but also the people who have chimed in and have, have given very uh, lucid uh, comments uh, and questions that have kind of animated this discourse. Thank you and good night. Thank you all. <laughs>